welcome and thanks for your patience uh, as we dealt with some technical snafus here everyone i appreciate that uh, your patience and um, for joining us we'll run a little later than planned but uh, i assure you it'll be worth it uh, the Makers Reykjavik Forums uh, are inspired by Richard Rhodes' play, Reykjavik, uh, which, as you may know, uh, it's about the Reagan-Gorbachev meeting in Moscow in 1986. And uh, Richard has crafted an extraordinary play. He has, has boiled down uh, the voices uh, of dozens of uh, diplomats from the transcripts down to uh, a distilled essence of, of two men talking about the fate of the world. Those two men happen to be Reagan and Gorbachev. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful jewel of a play. And uh, when I, I first read it, uh, I knew that we, we had to produce it. And so uh, it just is uh, something we're very excited to, to do. And I believe we'll have an actual physical production on stage uh, in March into April of 2021. Uh, that depends on safety issues and if the unions allow us uh, to be in the theaters and so forth. Um, we do intend to also uh, capture and, and live stream uh, a performance of that production. If things uh, turn out to be not safe to have an audience, we may in fact simply live stream uh, as some symphony orchestras are doing these days, live stream a performance from an empty theater uh, for, for folks to enjoy. Uh, either way, uh, we will send out updates to everyone on that. And this will, I, I hope, not be uh, the last virtual uh, maker's forum. Uh, today's topic is the Cold War and thermonuclear confrontation. Um, our panelists, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them now. And I want to begin with the gentleman who uh, has been a, a great help in coordinating this and bringing everything together. Uh, former uh, Chief uh, Arms Control Negotiator, Ambassador Thomas Graham, Jr. Ambassador, welcome. Next, we have Senior Policy Director from the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, Alexandra Bell. Alexandra, thank you for being here. Next is Program Director from Global Zero, Jessica Slate. And next is playwright, author, and author and historian, Richard Rhodes. Welcome, Richard. And last but certainly not least, our panel moderator, uh, president and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, Rachel Bronson. Rachel, good morning again, and uh, thanks for leading this panel. Great, Kurt. Thank you so much. Thank you to you for putting this together. I know we've been talking about this for months. I'm glad <laughs> that this is all moving forward. Um, my thanks to the Tonic Theater and the Board of Directors there for uh, helping us host this. We've got a great audience today. I see a lot of experts in the audience as well as I would assume regular um, uh, theater goers. So I know we're in for a, a good conversation. So I'm delighted to be here and I know my panelists feel the same way. So let's just kind of kick things off by setting the scene a little bit. And what I'd like to do is just focus all of our attention on how urgent these issues about nuclear risk and security are today. They can often feel that these issues should be somehow uh, packaged and put back into the Cold War. Um, but just reminding us where we are today and here in the United States, really on, on uh, the, the heels of, a, of an election coming up, uh, every major nuclear power is investing heavily in their nuclear arsenals. They've either gone through massive investments as the Russians have, or they're in the US stage, which is we are on the cusp of investing somewhere between 1.2 and $1.8 trillion over the next 30 years on our nuclear arsenal. I don't think anyone on this panel believes that some investment to ensure that uh, these, these uh, weapons stay safe as we have them uh, I'm sure the panelists would agree some investment is necessary, but 1.2 to 1.8 trillion over 30 years really suggests a wholesale um, uh, redoing of our of our current arsenal. And I think as for the Americans on this call, the question is really whether that's a good investment of our uh, of our hard fought resources. 
in addition to these major um, uh, investments and just put it out there, it's not just the US, of course, and, this, and the Russians, although we can, uh, control 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal, pass, uh, Pakistan has the fastest growing nuclear arsenal on the planet. And the Indian uh, Pakistani confrontation is one that most experts look at to say is kind of the, the most dangerous uh, around the globe and all of them are quite dangerous. Um, at the same time where we have this happening, we have the uh, global uh, arms control architecture seriously under threat. There's one remaining arms control agreement between the US and the Russians in the context of nuclear arms control. And that is set to expire in February of 2021. And after that, there will be none between the two countries bilaterally. We do have, excuse me, we do have um, a global regime, but that too is under threat. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, the MPT, is uh, just um, in May, uh, recognized its 50th anniversary. And the, um, the talks that were due to take place at the UN were delayed in May because of COVID and we're expecting them probably in January, I believe, is the new date, but very few people are expecting anything positive to come out of that. So that sets the stage with massive investments being made um, the architecture straining, if not collapsing, um, and you see in the different nuclear postures of the countries an increasing belief, or uh, an increasing sense that these, new, these weapons are usable. So let's start with the first question, Richard. With that as context, I'm going to direct the first question uh, to you, Richard Rhodes. You are a Pulitzer Prize winning author, journalist, and historian who most recently wrote in a really important book on the future of energy, looking forward. But in this play, you decide to take us back to the Reykjavik sum, uh, summit in the middle of the 1980s and reintroduce to us, reintroduce us to the two titans on the global stage at the time, US President Ronald Reagan and General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Why? Why was this, the mo why was this moment so compelling that you turned your attention back in history to it and decided to, to bring audiences through to relearn what happened at that moment. I was working on a uh, third volume of my nuclear history series, which came to be called Arsenals of Folly and was looking at the uh, Reykjavik summit, which would be included in that book. Uh, and was fascinated by what almost happened there. I looked at both the American and the Russian transcripts. And first of all, they were different. The American transcript left out all of Reagan's discussion of eliminating nuclear weapons, which was interesting. Uh, the Russian transcript, which was verbatim, included that discussion. But most centrally, there was a moment in those two days at Reykjavik, which were supposed to be simply a run up to a major summit to be held in Washington, when these two men came within a hair's breadth of agreeing to begin the total elimination of all nuclear weapons in the world. And given the struggle that has proceeded across the decades about what to do with these immensely destructive weapons. Uh, I wouldn't even call them weapons, these immensely destructive uh, mass destruction devices. It was fascinating to me that these two men, and particularly these two men, would have felt that it would po was possible to proceed with the total elimination of these things. So I thought, how do I get this into the world. And uh, one of the rules of doing a series of books is each book sells half as many copies as the preceding volume, which I would say has worked out pretty well in terms of my four volumes. What other medium was there? And I thought about a play, because here we could actually see these two people walking around. And because the transcripts were so complete, it was possible to to reconstruct with almost total accuracy. In fact, the problem was turning documents into living speech. 
I happened to mention this to an old friend of mine, Paul Newman, the actor, and he said, I'll help you with that. So I would send him drafts of the script and I would get a call in his charming way, Rhodes, Newman here, one word, colloquialize, he said. Otherwise, all your audience are gonna be out in the parking lot unlocking their cars. So, so we did a number of drafts, but the point and the serious point was to bring to the world this event that everyone had tried basically to suppress. You know, President Reagan talked to Margaret Thatcher after the Reykjavik summit and she just scored him up and down. She is rumored to have actually bopped him on the head with her purse because she said, you can't do that. You can't eliminate nuclear weapons. The world will fall apart. And I think that was the general mentality. So the issue for me was, and it was an important issue, who were these two men? What did they have about them that was different from all the others who had circled around this issue in so many ways? And I think the answer was they weren't, they weren't uh, Washington and Moscow insiders. They were both outsiders, in each in his own way. Gorbachev grew up on a collective farm. He was so aware that his people were, were close to not having enough to eat. Uh, and, and he was having to buy grain in that period of time from the United States, strangely enough. Uh, Reagan was an outsider as well, an actor who'd come into all of this. Uh, so this was a chance to present these two people to ask what about their way of looking at the world made it possible for them to imagine. Of course, it didn't happen. That's another story. Uh, let me just quickly tell that story because President Reagan wanted to make this happen and had since he was, since the end of the Second World War, he'd always believed nuclear weapons were a disaster, but he never figured out how and particularly didn't think a treaty could be trusted. So he thought of SDI, of Star Wars, that this would be a technical system that would allow him to, his country to be protected from nuclear weapons. Uh, Gorbachev, of course, saw it just the opposite, that a country that had an umbrella, if you will, a shield, uh, especially when the arms uh, reduction got down to just a few weapons, would be able to, to uh, accomplish a first strike. So it was a real struggle back and forth about that issue. And it came down to Reagan going to meet with his group, George Schultz, Richard Pearl, and others, and talk about whether or not they, he should accept this deal that they had, he and Gorbachev had been discussing. And Richard Pearl, who was kind of the Iago in this story, I'm sorry, he's not in the play. He was in an earlier draft. Uh, Pearl cleverly said, Mr. President, if, if you go with this, Congress won't fund SDI. And since Reagan believed SDI was the magic key to making all this happen, he finally said, no, we can't agree to eliminate nuclear weapons. But much began then. In a way, the end of the Cold War began then. Inspections began then. Uh, treaties began then. We're in a very different place now, to be sure. But that fundamental concept that a few, that it's possible to talk about this and think about this was central to that play. Thank you. Let me let me just follow up on, on that because it came up in our in our earlier conversation as well, which is that you as the the author of this play, the playwright, had to make some decisions, and an important one was to cast off some of these really important supporting actors, right, and really just focus on the two leaders contributing in some ways to the sense that it's all about the two leaders and who's at the top whereas clearly there's also an infrastructure of really important people. How, how did you decide to, to move them aside and what, what maybe tell us one of the gems there that got cut out that you was so hard to cut out, but that you decided just had to because it wasn't gonna work. Well, this really was working with a, an earlier director of this play 
uh, his suggestion because he saw, as I had not still attached as I was to the original event, I mean, I'm a historian more than a playwright, of course, <clears throat> he saw that, that, that the crux of the matter was these two men and that everything else in a way drew, took away from that intensity. And I really regretted getting rid of Richard Pearl because I had, I had literally gone to read, reread Othello, thinking here's my Iago. And he was whispering in Othello's ear, if you will, no, 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 this is dangerous. So really it was the, having to drop Richard Pearl that was the, the key decision in all of this, but also just paring everything down. And then as a, as a novice playwright, seeing how the characters came forward, Reagan and Gorbachev, as you cleared away, I had nine characters originally. So clearly there was a lot of room for, for compression. And, and that's exactly what, what followed and what made, I think, the play work, if indeed it works, and it seems to me it does. The other little detail I'll give you was, uh, I kept having a sense that we needed some comic relief at various places. And there is a bit of comic relief. Reagan tells, as he did, some rather clunky jokes, which Gorbachev responds to with, with a little bit of kind of, what is going on here? But I wanted something a little more physical. And I thought about, they had a little discussion about, oh, Mr. President, you're, you're kind of a type B actor, aren't you? And Reagan bridling and saying, well, in some of the movies I was in, and he talks about some of his roles, but I have them do something that didn't actually happen, but could have. And that is Reagan proposes to Gorbachev that he teaches him how to teach him how to dance a soft shoe. And so on stage, the two world leaders are doing a one, a two, a doodly doodly do. Uh, the audience loves it, of course. It's a moment of, of relief from all the intensity of the discussion. Thank you. You may be the only one in history who's been able to drop Richard Pearl. So congratulations on that. <laughs> That's pretty unprecedented. <laughs> Let me turn it over to Jessica. Jessica, I think that uh, um, th this is a perfect segue for, to you, which is what Richard was saying about Reagan's view on, um, on arms control and that, there, that for him it was about weapon systems that would ultimately keep the, the two countries safe if we had to have, or certainly the United States safe if we had to have nuclear weapons. So can you remind us and take us back to 1986, 1985, the middle 80s, where were we in terms of the balance of power? And what does this look like as Reagan's thinking that SDI is going to be ultimately what gives American safety, but then also the Russian response? So put us back in this, help, help start filling out the picture for us of, of the context in which these two men are negotiating the future of nuclear weapons. Sure, yeah, and uh, thank you for Tonic, to Tonic Theater and Ambassador Graham and Richard for all your work with putting this together. It's the thread of 1986 to now is really, um, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty apparent once we're talking through these discussions. Um, but in terms of the nuclear landscape in the mid 19, the early to mid 1980s, um, I'm going to start with just pure numbers. Um, in 1986, the year of the summit, the U.S. and the Soviet combined had an estimated 68,000 nuclear weapons, and it was the apex of what was the nuclear arms race. Um, the U.S. had about 23,000, Russia had about 45,000. Um, and this nuclear arms race really started once the Soviets first tested their first nuclear weapons successfully in 1949. And the U.S. was no longer the only nuclear arms power. And so they had to contend in this world where an, a superpower now had a nuclear capability. And so each side kind of strived and embarked on this quest for strategic balance. Um, and that's where each side's priority is to maintain their ability to deter an attack um, by the other side. And in order to deter that attack, they have to maintain the ability to use their nuclear weapons. Um, so if we wanna kind of look at the strategic balance, the so-called strategic balance as a scale, 
um, what we're seeing is that the United States feels that they are superior, conventionally insuperior um, to the Soviets. So the US is here and the Soviets are here. And so the, U the US invests in their nuclear capabilities in order to level out what they see as this imbalance. And so when they do that, it actually tips the scales, whether in real, um, whether it's a real tip or whether it's a perceived tip by the Soviets, it doesn't matter. The Soviets now see an imbalance that the US has an advantage over them. So then the Soviets are gonna invest in their nuclear forces and they're going to tip the scales back. And so this keeps going back and forth between the US and the Soviets, and it's just investments after investments in a cycle that isn't stopping. Um, but at the same time, this goes beyond just numbers. You have to take into account capabilities. You have to take into account strategies. Um, and taking that into account, Take, um, one of the strategies that came out of the 1960s and the 1970s for both the US and the Soviets was this strategy of launch on warning. So launch on warning just means that you are keeping your nuclear weapons ready to launch at a moment's notice so that you, as we'll say the US, if you see that the Russians are launching an attack on you, if you get warning of an attack on you or your allies, you are able to launch before those nuclear weapons hit you. Because those nuclear weapons that are incoming could affect your ability to launch your own nuclear weapons. So this strategy and numbers and capabilities that we're talking about in this balance creates complete instability. You know, strategic balance is such a misnomer, there is no balance here. Um, and fighting for that balance just creates more instability. So um, I think this was really um, epitomized in 1983 and the events of 1983 that culminated in the Abel Archer War Scare in November. Um, so if we go back to 1983 when Reagan was president, he, as Richard pointed out, Reagan was actually not a fan of nuclear weapons, um, but he campaigned on this concept of peace through strength and building up their systems and being stronger than the Soviets. Um, so a few events happened in 1983 um, that, in, that contributed even more to this growing sense of Soviet paranoia of a US nuclear first strike and just general US-Soviet tensions. In February of 1983, Reagan um, made a speech to the, to the American public um, and he designated the Soviets an evil empire. Um, that's not a great <laughs> way to do things. Um, and um, some of officials in his own um, advisory group were very upset with this designation that Reagan publicized. Um, a few weeks after that, Reagan announced that new initiative, that strategic defense initiative, that SDI, that he was putting so much hope in to, to be able to um, eliminate the Soviet um, nuclear threat. To the Soviets, that's incredibly destabilizing. Um, and that tips that scale on that balance. Um, and, um, the US also was stepping up uh, reconnaissance missions. They were sending in a lot of spy planes over the Soviet Union that were um, crossing the Soviet borders, um, doing this at increasing frequency. And on September 1st of 1983, a Soviet defense air crew actually shot down a Korean airliner and killed all 269 passengers on that Korean jet because, in part, they had mistaken it for an American spy plane. And an American spy plane had actually crossed into Soviet borders earlier that day. Um, so there's all of this tension. And then in November of 1983, NATO um, undergoes an annual large-scale exercise called Able Archer 83, in which 
the officers were testing protocols that they would go through if a conflict escalated from conventional war to nuclear war. Um, as I mentioned, this was an annual exercise. The Soviets knew about the exercise and they monitored the exercise, which was routine. But there were new elements that raised the alarm in the Soviet Union that NATO was actually using this exercise as a cover for launching a nuclear first strike. So US bombers during this exercise, US strategic bombers took to their runways. They were loaded with dummy warheads that looked incredibly realistic. Um, the nuclear launch, or the nuclear alert was raised gradually all the way up to general alert, which is the final stage before war. And the Soviets are monitoring this in real time. And they reacted as if NATO was going to attack them with nuclear weapons, that NATO was going to issue a first strike on the Soviet unions. So the Soviets put their nuclear forces on alert and their nuclear warheads were transferred from storage site to missile launchers. And then the Americans are watching this and um, kind of scratching their heads a little bit, but they're also not too concerned with it. They're like, they know that this is an exercise. Um, you know, their reactions are actually kind of rational. Um, we're just gonna keep to this exercise. Um, until a few days, after the exercise, there was a, a Soviet double agent um, that was working with the UK. And that agent came and gave evidence to the UK to say, the Soviets really thought that the US was going to launch a nuclear attack under the cover of a NATO exercise. And you need to know this. And the UK shared this information with the US. And Reagan was briefed on it and he was shocked. And this really had um, uh, an effect on Reagan in terms of this whole US Soviet instability crisis, Cold War possibly turning hot. And Reagan was like, all right, we need to, we need to dial this down. It is interesting that some other American officials didn't really put much into the Soviet kind of paranoia or rational paranoia, I think. Um, they actually were thinking that the Soviets were playing this up so that the U.S. would back down. But, but I think Reagan was really correct in his assessment of this is real, this is, this is hot, um, and we need to be talking to the, the Soviets. And I, I like to think that Reagan was almost even a little bit offended in saying that, you know, why would they even think that? How could they see us like that? Well, you called them an evil empire. That might have had something to do with it and some of the other things that were happening then. But I think it also um, pushed Reagan into the Strategic Defense Initiative even more so, because like was mentioned, he didn't really believe treaties could bring about um, zero nuclear weapons. So. So with all of this crisis instability and real nuclear war scares, um, I think Reagan came into um, talks with the Russians or the Soviets really kind of settling on SDI as like the ultimate kind of backup here. And that's why he, he wouldn't give it up. Um, but that's kind of the, the, the context we're working with. Thank you. Um, perfect, and that sets Tom up um, for a question I have for you. And first of all, congratulations on the publication of your new novel on tyranny, uh, tyranny and crisis. I think it's just out a few days now. So congratulations on that. Um, hey, you're one of them. And give me an endorsement too. So I, I want to thank him. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, you're one of America's foremost um, warriors for arms control. Uh, you've devoted your career to delivering some of the most consequential arms control agreements of the nuclear age. You were active during uh, much of the time we've been discussing. So building on what Jessica just described for us, remind us of the challenges that were confronted at this moment and the role Reykjavik played uh, just a few years before the end of the Cold War. What were you and your colleagues up against and, and, and what was the sense, you know, what, 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 is the, the, what was the sense at the time and shortly thereafter about uh, the Reykjavik and what happened there? 
Well, first let me say that from the earliest time, uh, uh, arms control went right along with uh, strategic uh, uh, development. There were people at the very beginning that wanted to control uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Secretary of War Stimson personally stopped uh, the atomic bombing of Kyoto, which was number one on the Air Force list, and several times he took it off, and uh, he, he personally. And, uh, and then after he left government, shortly after the end of the war, he made the first speech about how these weapons must be controlled, the first arms control speech by one of the men that uh, oversaw the development of them. And then there was the Baruch plan, which didn't go anywhere, but it was an attempt to internationalize uh, the nuclear technology, sort of, but the US would keep its, uh, its uh, monopoly. Um, uh, the Russians uh, rejected it out of hand. At the time, perhaps the US didn't understand the degree to which uh, Soviet spying at Los Alamos had, had basically brought them pretty close uh, to the bomb. But, uh, but when the bomb, uh, when, when the Soviet bomb appeared in 1949, uh, our response then was not, um, how are we going to control this? Let's negotiate. It was to build the hydrogen bomb and also to build uranium bombs at what the French called an industrial rhythm. And uh, in the subsequent years uh, leading up to the early 60s were uh, on the one hand, the US and Soviets building up, as Jessica described, these enormous, uh, ridiculously large arsenals to the point where they uh, very early on ran out of targets. They were dropping uh, they were planning to drop 100 kiloton uh, bombs on small bridges in Central Europe and, 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 and things like that. And we ultimately built 72,000 and they built 55,000 weapons and, and at one time had 32,500 in our uh, inventory, active inventory. And, but they had declined, as Jesse explained, as, as somewhat as we uh, moved toward Reykjavik. And in 1961, um, the concern was not only the arms race, it was the fact that other countries now were getting into this business. So the British were first, and then the French in 1960, and uh, Sweden had a program, Switzerland was uh, considering the possibility, and everyone believed that China certainly uh, and Israel might might soon have have the bomb. And uh, Kennedy uh, uh, was gave a press conference in in the spring of '63, um, uh, in which he talked about the arms negotiations on test ban at at at, the, uh, at Geneva and the, how much he hoped they su would succeed. And he said that uh, my greatest fear is that. Um, that in 1970, there'll be 10 nuclear weapon states rather than four. And in 1975, there'll be 15 or 20. And he said that I would regard that as the greatest possible danger and hazard. Um, and uh, about that time, movement began toward the uh, nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was uh, uh, with twists and turns eventually signed in 1968 and, and entered into force in 1970. But the price for it, here you have most of the world giving up the most destructive weapon ever created, five countries allowed to keep it. And, and so what, what's their obligation? Well, it was to, uh, uh, stop the arms race, reduce nuclear weapons, and share peaceful nuclear technology. But most important, it was to stop testing and have a comprehensive, complete 
test ban and um, this this price still hasn't been paid the republicans in the senate have blocked it ever since uh, 1999 it has like 170 parties but there's about six or seven key parties most of which are depending on the united states to join and we still haven't and there's no sign that uh, we will but also, as I mentioned, it was to stop the arms race was their obligation, and that had already begun with SALT-1. And, and, and um, SALT-1 was essentially a freeze. Let's, let's stop building where we are. And I remember I asked one of my Soviet counterparts in those days, I said, well, if we hadn't had this freeze, how many, how many, uh, how many of these uh, ICBMs would you have built? And he said, we would have built them until our general said we had enough. And uh, as, as probably everyone or many know, um, the request out of the Pentagon was 10,000. We built, uh, the Kennedy administration built 1,000. So we easily could have had many, many more. And, and um, then uh, after, uh, after uh, SALT-1, which went along okay with the Congress and was ratified uh, in due course, uh, the SALT-2 began. Which, SALT-2 involved the first reductions. Uh, the freeze was in place and the first reductions, uh, just a 10% reduction, but also a, a stopping new types of weapons. It, it, it put a freeze on, on um, 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 uh, new technologies, like, and, and also uh, put strict, strict limits on, on MERV systems. For example, each side would only allow MERVs, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, uh, uh, which meant that one one missile could hit ten targets. Um, uh, that there was um, uh, the first strict limits on 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 that were were adopted, and um, uh, this this uh, th this is another technology that that almost got out of hand but but didn't uh, salt two brought it under some kind of uh, rational limit but at the same time salt two also became part of the 1980 presidential election senator howard baker ran for president solely on the grounds of uh defeating salt two and 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 uh the, the um, hearing that we had, uh, we had three days of hearings before the Senate Foreign Relations uh, in seeking uh, Senate um, uh, advice and consent to ratification. And one of my uh, colleagues, a, a devout Catholic said uh, afterwards, it was this final, final vote was 14 members, nine to five, with Baker very much in the negative. And as uh, she said, she wrote on the wall of my office, Christians nine, lions four, and 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 uh, it 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 just became impossible, and and in the wake of Afghanistan, salt two was abandoned in the Senate, but when Reagan was elected, uh, he was wise enough to agree to informally observe uh, uh, so, so, um, salt two. Uh, to, to the end of its term, which was 1985, and he um, he began two new negotiations. Uh, they were um, the Euro missile negotiation. Chancellor Schmidt of uh, of Germany uh, had complained in a famous speech at Triple uh, IS that uh, that um, in all Americas concentration on, on the strategic balance, it was ignoring the Euro strategic balance. The Soviets were uh, building uh, a very large number of SS-20s 
along the uh, border with Europe, which looked very different from the missiles they'd always had there before. They looked like war fighting missiles. And, uh, and, and, and this became a very big issue in the, in the early 80s. And, and um, uh, uh, Paul Nitzer was our initial negotiator and he tried to cut a deal uh, uh, himself without instructions with the Soviet ambassador to uh, to have equal to, for for the U.S. to give up ballistic missiles but keep its long-range cruise missiles, and uh, the Soviets a small, a small, much smaller number of SS-20s, and the U.S. got to keep uh, on its side the French and British uh, missiles, which was a big, big point for the Soviets, and 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 I mean they didn't want them and. So anyway, he, he made this deal, it was really a very good deal, brought it back and, and Reagan um, uh, was initially interested in it at the first National Security Council. But Richard Pearl, who was mentioned earlier, was out of town. And when he got back, he was able to turn the Secretary of Defense around and he vetoed it in the next discussion. And so Reagan went along uh, along with that, and and um, uh, the uh, uh, Nitsi, when he went back, told the Soviets that we couldn't do the so-called walk in the woods uh, uh, agreement, and we had this huge interagency debate just before the second uh, um, a meeting of the National Security Council, and Richard Pearl. I mean, there must have been 40 people there. And Nitsa was there, and I was there with him. And, and Richard Pearl levied against Nitsa the ultimate, the ultimate insult. I mean, the, it's, it's as far as you could possibly go. He said, Paul, he said, the trouble with you is you're an inveterate problem solver. I mean, what greater insult could there be? And, and uh, anyway, so that didn't happen. And we went back to the regular grind on on-site inspection. I mean, on, uh, on um, uh, INF uh, Euro missiles. At the same time, uh, uh, since, start, since SALT wasn't being ratified, um, uh, uh, Reagan began an alternative, even though he informally observed uh, uh, so to, to the end of its term, they called START, the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, and uh, the, the, uh, it, it, which went for deeper reductions. Instead of 10%, it was somewhat more, somewhat deeper than, than that. And of course, the Re Republicans pointed out that they were the real arms controllers because they limited warheads. Uh, and, and those weak-kneed Democrats, they limited launchers. And of course, uh, the way you identify warheads is identify a warhead with its missile and the missile with its launcher. So it mounted to exactly the same thing, but it just sounds different. And, and uh, so that went on all through the 80s and was finally concluded uh, after the collapse, well, just before the collapse of the of the Soviet Union, and so the at the at the end the um, uh, the Salt Treaty had to be reorganized to have five parties: Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, as well as the U.S. and Russia, and the other three agreed to give up all the weapons they had. And, and Russia would be the nuclear weapon state. And those were very, very fraught negotiations with Ukraine, not, not with the other two. And they finally had to do, do a joint security agreement with Russia saying that never, never, never would any of us, Russia, Britain, France, uh, US, uh, uh, try to change uh, Ukraine's borders. Um, we, know, we know how well that, that worked. Um, but um, uh, Reykjavik, Reykjavik is often thought of as a failed 
effort to eliminate nuclear weapons, but it, it, it did other things that were very good that are often not mentioned. Uh, first, uh, the, the two leaders agreed on levels for the INF Treaty and eliminated thereby an entire class of medium range nuclear weapon systems. And initially they agreed that the negotiation was in Europe. Initially they agreed uh, only to uh, weapons in Europe. These were systems that were um, uh, in range capability uh, from a thousand, I believe, to 5,000 kilometers in, in range capability and strategic weapons were uh, over 5,000. And, and, uh, and then this led to the Japanese complaining and, and they said, well, you know, if you're eliminating them in Europe, why do you have to keep them here? And, and finally that was agreed that they, we, would, we would eliminate all of them everywhere. And, uh, um, and so, it, it, but, but most important at all, of all, and the most important single development in arms control in the entire history, in my opinion, was that, at least as far as US Soviet things go, was that uh, Gorbachev agreed to intrusive on-site inspection for the INF Treaty and for START. And when we got to START, I mean, uh, uh, am, I, am I the only lawyer here? Anyway, a START is a lawyer's dream. There's so many documents and I mean- and Tom, let me, let me start and stop you there just because I think you put a lot on the table and we're gonna come back if we have enough time, but- One more thing to say. One yeah. More thing. So INF was signed in, in, um, in uh, Moscow in, uh, uh, in 1980, uh, sorry, signed in Washington in 1987 and brought into force by Reagan and Gorbachev in Moscow. And after the, the ceremony, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev were walking arm in arm uh, in Red Square. It was a beautiful spring day. And a reporter came up to, to Reagan and he said, uh, Sir, Mr. President, is this still the evil empire? And Reagan said, no, that was another place, another time. And that was the real end of the Cold War. That's wonderful. Um, thank you for that and, and helping us to identify some of the positives that came out of, of Reykjavik. Alex, this is a perfect um, segue for you. You've devoted the, your career as well to uh, arms control, uh, arms control um, and trying to create a, a safer nuclear future, if you will. Um, you were just on a call this morning as we and I were talking earlier in a track two conversation with the Russians about dealing with uh, the kind of new threats that are tied up in um, uh, nuclear security conversations today, including cyber. I wanna get to that um, maybe in, in the next round, we're going to have to be uh, all of us a little bit more mindful of, of time so that we can kind of bring us up to the presence. But Alex, like help, help segue uh, us from uh, 1986 uh, <laughs> to the present, right? So what, in, when you think of Reykjavik and some of the things that Tom was talking about and, and the, the strategic balance that, um, uh, that Jessica was talking about, the landscape that um, that Richard was talking about, what's the importance of the legacy of Reykjavik for, for you? Um, and, and how does that shape what, what comes next? Thanks, Rachel. Uh, and, and thanks so much for having me here. It's an honor to be alongside uh, these esteemed panelists. Uh, I actually helped my first boss in DC review uh, Arsenals of Bali for the New York Review of Books. And I remember a line that Richard found uh, for the research in that book. It was about a young Dick Cheney and how his politics were somewhere to the right of Darth Vader. And that <laughs> line in the book has stuck with me ever since. Um, so well to, to the right. Um, uh, so to me, the legacy of Reykjavik was really, um, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book actually called The Triumph of Improvisation, uh, that uh, great things can happen if, if, if sometimes you don't actually know what's gonna come of it. It's, uh, 
it's, it's about the value of diplomacy. It's a clear demonstration that even in dark times when tensions seem high and progress seems unlikely, um, there's always the possibility of a breakthrough. Uh, and the Reykjavik summit was just that, a, a breakthrough in a, in a little cottage by the sea. Um, and when I say cottage, I definitely mean that. Uh, the Hofti house is nothing short of adorable. There's, you know, gingerbread accents and the smell of wood burning stoves. And um, I had the honor of going there actually for the 30th anniversary of the summit. Um, I was able to walk around and we actually had a track two dialogue um, as part of it. But I sat at the table where Reagan and George Schultz were hammering through proposals, I even took a picture in the seats, of course, with me playing Reagan. Uh, and uh, I marveled that the US delegation at one point had a side meeting in a bathroom uh, with you know, staffers lined up sitting on the edge of the bathtub and somebody on the commode and, and, and the president got an actual chair, uh, which I think is advisable. But um, you know, it's just tiny and they were having these huge globally impactful conversations in this tiny little house. And I think about those humble, quiet surroundings um, that gave the two most powerful men in the world uh, the opportunity to momentarily leave the trappings of their position, the pomp and circumstance that tended to surround them, um, and really, you know, worked and got down to the brass tacks of how they made the could make the world a better place. Um, so, as has been mentioned, the summit came short of creating the ground for full disarmament. But I really think that uh, from there and the subsequent uh, statements that President Reagan made, he he made it clear that it was the goal. Um, of the United States, whether run by Republicans or Democrats, that a, you know, a nuclear free world is where we're going. Um, and this has held through administration since that. It's a little bit different now. Uh, it's admittedly a little harder to tell where the, where the current president is on any of these issues, but uh, even he has talked throughout his career um, about the need to reduce nuclear threats. And it, I really think it, it sort of, it set us on a path that hopefully we will continue on. Uh, the INF Treaty and the subsequent START Treaty and New START Treaty um, have helped reduce the number of deployed strategic nuclear warheads, the really big warheads that go a really long distance, uh, to the lowest level since the 1950s. Like, uh, as bad as sometimes this all seems, we've made great progress in saving ourselves from ourselves. And uh, right now, though, we're in a bit of a diplomatic, theoretical, political rut when it comes to US Russian arms control, uh, to me, no matter who wins the elections, uh, I think the leaders of these two countries should take note, uh, take a, a, a cue from Reagan and Gorbachev and get back to meeting you know, face to face with only a small group of advisors um, and really get down to the nuts and bolts of where we go, how we deal with the new challenges that we're facing, um, cleaning out the ash and the trash of the Cold War that still remains. Uh, following that, I think both countries should consider expanding the concept of Reykjavik, uh, perhaps basing permanent or semi-permanent uh, interagency teams in a European city, uh, and maybe not Geneva or Vienna, that those cities can, you know, sort of get trapped in uh, the international intrigue and, and sort of tension that, that goes, find, you know, find a smaller place uh, that can induce the kind of interactions that will help us deal with these new threats that we're facing conventional weapon advancements, AI, cyber development, synthetic biology, and more. Um, so the, the legacy of Reykjavik, um, you know, should be on the minds of leaders, both here and in Moscow and around the world, uh, for the simple reason that when, when we talk quietly and intimately and without guile, uh, good things can happen. And uh, so I hope, that, I hope that takes place. But I'm a bit of an optimist, I, I admit it. Great, thank you. And uh, I'll do a, a shameless plug for for uh, for Alex Bell's work um, on our site at thebulletin.org. We have uh, re-upped our September issue where we look at nuclear weapons uh, in the presidential uh, election. And Alex has a great piece there. So suck everything you can out of what Tonic Theater is offering. But if you want to know more, I would refer you to Alex's terrific piece along with uh, many other really uh, thoughtful people about how this all matters in, in the November election. Alex, thank you for contributing to that. Um, okay, we have to do a bit of a speed round because we've appropriately taken a lot of time. And Richard, you're gonna start us off, but I'm sure you have a lot on your mind given what you've just heard. But I wanna come back to you because, um, because Reagan and Gorbachev, Reagan in particular, I know, but Gorbachev as well, has some ideas of what they wanted to leave behind, what they wanted the legacy 
of Reykjavik to be? And why don't you set the, the stage for us moving to why Reykjavik, Reykjavik matters today, talking with us a little bit what they had in mind. And uh, then we'll turn back to our panelists moving kind of quickly and hopefully uh, there'll be time uh, for, I believe, for Q and A with the audience. So uh, Richard, back to you. Good. Um, let me just say up front, I think Alex's idea, perhaps we should find a way to get this play performed at the White House with the new administration. I think that would be a very helpful thing for everyone. Um, Gorbachev went to Reykjavik with an idea which he had picked up from Willy Brandt, the uh, German prime minister who had previously been the mayor of Berlin. Willy Brandt in turn had got it from uh, the Swedish prime minister who was later assassinated, Olaf Palma, who I think probably picked it up indirectly or directly from the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr had conceived what he called common security. When he went in 1944 to talk to Franklin Roosevelt and he hoped Churchill and Stalin, although that didn't quite happen the way he wanted it to, Bohr had a basic idea in mind. And he phrased it later on in one sentence. We are in an entirely new situation that cannot be resolved by war. That to me is the fundamental story of the discovery of how to release nuclear energy in the world. We are in an entirely new situation that cannot be resolved by war. Out of that came an idea translated, as I said, through this chain of, of what Gorbachev took to Reykjavik of common security. Common security was an idea basically that instead of going for maximum pressure against your enemy, you try, or your opponent, you try to find the minimum amount of, of defense and pressure and that, that you can put together that satisfies your own needs for security, but will help the other side find its limits as far as what it needs for security. In the case of the Germans, it had to do with the, what the Soviets wanted, which was that the border between East and West Germany be declared final and accepted on all sides. The Germans gave uh, Gorbachev that in the late 80s, and in a way it was the beginning of the end for the Cold War in regard to East and West Germany and that division. Gorbachev saw common security as a way of saying, we don't need this huge arsenal. We don't need this enormous uh, complexity of defenses back and forth. We can reduce down to a minimum what we have and take it from there as we come to trust each other more and more. So common security for me is the real and fundamental thing that came out of Reykjavik. It's been forgotten, it's been obscured, it's been perhaps set aside by, by people who are much more hawkish, but it is finally, I believe, the only way we will eventually move past this, this endless chain, uh, as was described earlier so eloquently, of back and forth and back and forth. We're in the midst of what's kind of like a potlatch ceremony where both sides throw as much of their, their wealth into the fire as they think they can to overwhelm the other side with, with their, their power over the other side. And it simply has not worked. So that to me was what really came out of Reykjavik in all of its, all of its interesting complexities, but common security. Thank you. Jessica, you talked about how the, the overwhelming numbers in terms of delivery systems that we and the Russians had, or Soviets had invested in. And um, now if you look at those numbers, they're um, down significantly. Um, but, and you would think that would give us all a, a reason to breathe easy, but um, we don't, and I suspect you don't. Um, so tell us a little bit about what's going on now building off of this visions of views of common security, but really like, where are we? You can look at the number of war, warheads and that's down too, but our delivery systems and that's down, but it doesn't feel that, that much safer right now. In fact, for many, it feels 
uh, quite dangerous. You want to jump in on that to bring us up to where we are in September of 2020? Yeah, and I, 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 I hope for a time where we can breathe, um, but that's not quite here yet. Um, Ambassador Graham and all of his um, colleagues, both on the Russian, Soviet, and American side, um, did a lot. Did a really great job to bring the numbers down um, significantly by by ninety percent. Um, but the U.S. and the Russians still have on order of four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, depending on if you're counting retired warheads, nuclear weapons. Which we went from the Cold War, where we had super duper, oh my goodness, holy cow, nuclear overkill, <laughs> to now we are at holy cow overkill. We are still, we still have entirely more weapons that then could be reasonably required to meet our mission. Um, and going off of what Richard said with common security, there are a number of steps that the U.S. and Russians can take to decrease the number of weapons that they have um, and change our strategies around nuclear weapons to reduce reliance on their use. So we still have those launch on warning policies that, that are vestiges of the Cold War. And they just don't make sense. If they did during the Cold War, they don't make sense now. Um, and what those strategies do is just increase this risk of accidental nuclear use by miscalculation, by um, a false warning of an indicated attack, all of these scenarios that are increasing the risk of nuclear use. And there's also this sense um, where we are now and with current administrations in the US and Russia of this thought that a nuclear war can be won and, and can be fought. Um, and there is no winning a nuclear war. Reagan and Gorbachev knew, knew that and they came out with their adage, um, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Unfortunately, we're, we're moving away from that. Um, and we are investing in systems that make nuclear weapons, Rachel, you alluded to this in your opening remarks, that are making those weapons more usable. So we're getting back to these kind of Cold War strategies that are just kind of going with the balance and creating that cycle um, that might not be about numbers, um, at least for now, when we still have New Start and we still have some of those guardrails on. Um, but the strategies and the capabilities are still that kind of cycle um, in investment in these capabilities. That's just as destabilizing as numbers. And so I think there are, there are things to do. And I, and I do absolutely share Alex's optimism. I do want to say that because I feel like on this panel, I'm just telling people how awful things are. <laughs> Um, but the, I think what Reykjavik shows, and Alex basically laid this out very beautifully, is that, you know, political will to make changes to reduce nuclear risk can be made. And I, I, I do worry that the political will is going to be made by a crisis. I, and I think that it's very important to have these discussions and to have these plays and to have public awareness around this threat so that we, the public, can create the pressure on our political leaders to say, you need to take steps to de-alert your nuclear weapons, take them off hair trigger, to end launch on warning policies, to implement no first use policies. All of these steps that can be taken as we work toward um, eliminating nuclear weapons that we need to be putting the pressure on our politicians because we can't rely on a crisis not going nuclear but scaring our political leaders enough to get to the table. We have to do that work. Great, thank you. Uh, so Tom, what is, we have to do that work. What does that look like for a, uh, what was the term you, let me, you said, uh, Richard, Pearl, when he looked at Nietzsche, said uh, an inveterate problem solver. So you, as an inveterate problem solver, tell us, what, where does, where does uh, pick up for where Jessica left off and tell us what that looks like. What, what, what should we do? Um, well, first place, we should ratify the test ban and make, make the 
non-proliferation treaty secure. And that also means uh, facing up to the Middle East uh, uh, conflict over the Israeli arsenal and Iran's ambitions. And uh, those are the two things threatening the NPT right now. And we need to face up to both of them and we can do that. Uh, with respect to Russia, uh, we need to extend New Start, of course, and then uh, uh, try, it will be difficult, uh, try to begin further negotiations. The right level, I've always thought, when I left government in 19, uh, well, maybe that was, 1997, so far back, uh, when I left gover government then, I read an article by the um, American Academy of Science and uh, by someone who uh, was saying that 300 weapons per superpower was enough. And I thought that was, that was pretty persuasive. I still believe that. Uh, 300, no country that is, you know, no country needs nuclear weapons, period. But if you're going to still have nuclear weapons, 300 is the most anybody would need. And we're far from that. And, uh, and lower numbers for, for some of the others. Because uh, if, if, if you can believe people who say the only purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter other nuclear weapons, then you don't need any more than that and, and probably less. But the, that, that's, that would be the level uh, I would aim at with, with the Russians. And with, with argu arguing that we should try at the same time to uh, together uh, lower the numbers of uh, uh, China, uh, France, Britain, uh, and, and maybe some of the outliers too. Thank you. I want to finish up this portion of our conversation. There's some great uh, questions in, in the chat and Milton Cole has given us a link to if, if we want to look at um, the arsenals and the mapping of that. So thank you for that. Alex, I want to end it with you and a, kind of a, a two-part question. One is, as I mentioned earlier, like you just this morning were sitting in conversations and you referenced some of the issues that are facing uh, current, negotiator, current negotiators, which is the advancement of, of uh, conventional weapons, AI, cyber. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit, maybe you can pull the curtain back and tell us where we're at now. And I also know on your mind, you think a lot, you're sitting here at like the heart of diplomacy and yet you believe that the arts and plays like this have a really important role to get to, to in moving forward the diplomatic process. So could you kind of weave those two together and then uh, we'll, we'll flip to some of the questions coming in on, on the chat and, and from uh, those who are listening in. Sure, thanks Rachel. And I'll also uh, sort of frame it by saying, you know, we have an election coming up. Um, and I know nuclear war really isn't at the top of mind for voters uh, anymore, uh, but it should be. Because uh, if we don't get nuclear issues right, uh, then nothing else really matters. Uh, and here's the hard truth. Uh, from an objective perspective, every single nuclear challenge facing the United States has gotten worse over the past three plus years. It's just the truth. Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon than it was on January 20th, 2017. Uh, North Korea continues to advance its missile and nuclear programs. Uh, we are in, in the deepest rut we've been in with the Russians as far as uh, what to do next. Uh, we don't even really have a shared concept of what to do next on arms control. Um, so the question is, how do we deal with those challenges? Um, while I would advise a heavy uh, emphasis on diplomacy and efforts to create arms control and non-proliferation agreements, uh, others in, in this country would say that we should lean into our nuclear weapons for defense and stability and perhaps even build more. Uh, my problem with that is that every single nuclear weapon in the world um, represents a threat. And uh, if we maintain the status quo or increase the number of nuclear weapons in our world, one will eventually go off. And if one goes off, a lot might go off. And the law of odds is simply not on our side here. And so that's why I involve myself in what might seem like a, a, rather, a rather dark profession, I guess, um, and, uh, and why I do things like track to discussions with the Russians, with the Chinese, um, it's so we can can work through these wicked problems. Uh, it's not easy. And, and particularly now on Zoom, you don't even have the benefit of getting to go have a vodka with folks after you've been fussing at them for a couple hours. Um, 
So it's, it's a little bit harder. It's harder to have those personal relationships that can kind of be the, the, the oil in the gears uh, that, you know, moves these products out that keep us all safer. Uh, but you just have to keep working the problems. Um, and, uh, and that means everybody plays a role, uh, folks like me, but, you know, constituents, people around the country, you know, even just the small part of being involved in the conversation, understand what we're going through. So that's what voters should really be taken into the voting booth uh, in November, like, you know, think about who's likely to understand and pragmatically reduce nuclear threats. And to be clear, it's not necessarily a partisan issue. Uh, Reagan was not, uh, as we've heard, uh, super into arms control at the beginning of his term, had a, a first term, he had a lot of doubts about it. Um, and then as, in his second term, he participated in Reykjavik and, uh, and really created the foundation for what is modern arms control today. Um, and an interesting point on that kind of change of heart and the shift um, it was reported that uh, in addition to these real world things happening like Abel Archer, uh, he saw the film uh, the day after in 1983, someone mentioned it in the comments. Um, it's a raw depiction of the realities and the horror of nuclear war. Uh, and it's reported that it really got to him. It really you know, got under his skin. Uh, and by the way, if you haven't seen the day after, it's available the, in, in its entirety on YouTube. You can just you know, watch it today. Uh, if you feel like getting really depressed. Uh, but the same thing actually happened to Bill Clinton. Uh, he read a book called Cobra Event about a biological weapons attack. Um, and it prompted him to really push for increased funding for biodefense. It's a testament to the power of art, of movies, of theater, uh, to really change hearts and minds and to get people to really think about complicated and difficult issues like reducing the threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. Um, that's why I'm really hopeful that Richard's play and more pieces like it can really uh, re-engage the general public, both here in the United States and around the world, uh, to, you know, get into the game and, and help us, uh, as I said, save ourselves from ourselves. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's just stay on the day after for a second, because you noted in, in the chat uh, a question of it. And Richard, uh, I'd like to follow up and pull you back in. It's from Helen Young. Um, her question is, is what Alex was talking about. Um, her understanding, as many of us, that the movie The Day After and meeting with Carl Sagan, where nuclear went through, was discussed, had a profound effect on Reagan. Uh, Alex was just talking about it. What evidence did you see, in the, if any, in, in the transcript of the discussions with Gorbachev? Is there any evidence there? Or, or to tell us about what you found in, in terms, if anything, of The Day After? It isn't in the transcript, but I should say the day after was, uh, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> and I remember vividly the image in that film of missiles coming over the horizon toward Kansas City. Uh, as someone who kind of escaped Kansas City, I must say I had mixed feelings about that. <laughs> but, but there's no question but that Reagan as someone who was obviously a film person, a theater, a motion picture person, was powerfully affected. I'm thinking of something else though, and that hasn't really come up in this discussion. We've been talking about a lot of the nuts and bolts of, of how you deal with these issues, but I would like to suggest that to a very great degree, this entire issue is kind of a chimera. If it was so straightforward for these two world leaders with all their experience in, in the complexities of, of running countries and so forth, to be able to agree with each other, at least initially, that the whole thing was a house of cards, then I think we should realize it is a house of cards, that it would be rel relatively simple, in fact, uh, to, to move from where we are to a very, very different place if people could agree. And then, of course, if the necessary uh, openness, as Niels Bohr called it, could be installed, meaning inspections and so forth around all of this. A lot of that system is already in place. We have methods, national so-called uh, technical means of, of keeping track of nuclear explosions everywhere in the world. And finally, one other point I want to add, the, the, the outcome of the nuclear winter business was finally a study done in 2007 using much more sophisticated and powerful computers. And what would happen if merely 100 nuclear weapons were exploded, uh, merely Hiroshima scale nuclear weapons over India and Pakistan in a regional nuclear war? And the, and, and the outcome was 
a temperature drop worldwide of two or three degrees annually for a fairly short several year period of time, but that that would be enough to cause crop failure worldwide and probably lead to the death of two billion human beings around the world. So even 300 nuclear weapons is too many. We need to get at very least below the level of a nuclear winter or nuclear autumn, whatever you want to call it. Thank you. I want to pick up on uh, Mantri uh, Manpreet Sethi's uh, comment uh, about how do we kind of create the environment for uh, moving forward. And there's a lot of talk in the US right now and, and um, trying to lean in on getting uh, Biden, at least in, in the, the, uh, the run up to the election to say uh, what Gorbachev and Reagan were able to say, uh, I think it was referred to by some of the panelists that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must never be fought. Um, so Manpreet's question is, is, you know, whether that would matter given that we have nine nuclear weapon states um, to have just two leaders, uh, the US and maybe the Russians, could we get to the point of saying that, would that even matter in, in that context? And so maybe I could ask our, our panelists to kind of talk about that, that notion of how important it is to say that a nuclear weapon can never uh, be won, so therefore must never be fought. And how far are we from that? And and how useful even would it be if, if uh, two of the nine countries' leaders actually said that? Uh, Tom, I might start with you on that, and then I'll bring in um, the others. OK, well, um, uh, Rachel, it depends on, on who you're talking with. Um, in my view, I think uh, you're not too far away from that uh, uh, in any normal uh, U.S. Uh, administration. I, I don't, I can't speak for this one, but everyone that went before it, um, at least for some years. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but. I, I sense that 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 Putin is not too far from that. Uh, he did want to extend New Start. He did say to uh, a local firebrand about starting something in the Caribbean. He said, "No, the last thing we need is a another conflict, another crisis of the Caribbean type." Those were his his words. Um, uh, she. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, he, he, he may have uh, enough uh, uh, good sense to, uh, to, to, to understand how nuclear weapons can, can wreck everything and therefore would be willing to sort of uh, at least consider embracing that concept. Now, when you get to some of the others, uh, North Korea, uh, Pakistan, India and Israel, I'm not sure any of those four would, would embrace that concept. Israel still believes that its nuclear weapons are its security blanket. Uh, so does Pakistan, so does North Korea. And um, India wants to keep nuclear weapons for the most incredibly complex reasons, which uh, I would be happy to lay out here, but uh, it would consume the rest of the time, so I won't. But uh, uh, read the history of the of the Indian weapon, and then you'll you'll get it. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> Jessica, let me bring you you in, into this. Uh, there's some really right the interesting discussions right now about whether you know how to uh, how to get to this 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 point of reducing the number of weapons, changing uh, the the um, balance, if you will. But I, I wonder if you could, you want to talk a little bit about um, arms control versus arms elimination, right? Which is, we do have a movement, a ban the bomb movement that's moving its way through the UN. And why don't you kind of lay that out for us where we are now and what are the different directions that we could be going and your thoughts on that? Sure, yeah. Um, so, of course, right now, as has been kind of laid bare, 
the um, progress that has been made on arms control is really up in the air at this point between the US and Russia. Um, and the last remaining treaty that we have is under threat. Um, I think that when we're talking about arms control, I see arms control as a road to arms elimination. Um, there is another kind of faction that you mentioned the treaty for the, uh, the TPNW, the ban treaty. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the acronym, um, but there's a movement that is calling for the just elimination of nuclear weapons and making them unlawful. And that really is gaining momentum because they're, they're concentrating on the humanitarian risks of nuclear weapons. And they are harnessing this frustration with nuclear weapon states to fulfill their commitments to negotiate in good faith for elimination. Um, so the lack of progress and even the reversal of some of that progress is really pushing some of these non-nuclear weapon states to come together and say, we need to put pressure um, and we need to normalize and strengthen the nuclear taboo because the nuclear taboo has been weakened as well. Um, I think for a way forward, this is a little bit um, divisive. Uh, to say the least, I guess, um, the nuclear weapon states have, have, you know, come together on something and that something is they will not sign the, the treaty. Um, but I do think there is a way forward. And like I mentioned, using arms control as, as a vehicle to get to elimination. And Ambassador Graham laid out that there are, with all these other nuclear armed states, there are all of these other security um, issues that have to be taken into account. Um, the reliance on nuclear weapons for, for countries' um, national security makes this more than a nuclear issue. You really have to look at um, common security in general, kind of like what Richard Rhodes was saying. Um, so there are a lot of issues to address and they're difficult issues, but um, I think the, um, the leadership side of this, um, it really does kind of depend on this election, um, but the US and Russia really have to lead still on this just because we have so many. Um, but I think we're on a road right now that might be treacherous, but there are U-turn signs just every, every step of the way. And, and it can be easy to, not easy, I don't wanna say easy, but it, it can happen that we will reverse and I think we will um, back up and realize that the way we're going is destabilizing and we need to, we need to get back to arms control. We need to um, address some of these other issues that come into play when we're talking about nuclear security um, or national security in general. And, and we can have a step-by-step -step process to eliminate these weapons, to get at their, their reason d'etre, if you will, and, and, and take that away and, and realize a world without nuclear weapons. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. Alex, I, I wanna throw the next question to you and Richard, I'm gonna give you the, the last um, kind of close up, closing remarks. Um, but Alex, I, I just can't let you go without you talking a little bit about what you're talking with the Russians about. What are the topics on their minds? What are, where, what, where can you find topics to discuss? And I'm sorry you can't go out for them with the vodka afterwards because presumably that's where a lot of things get decided and agreed to. But tell us, like when you go into these conversations, what are the topics? Where, where, where are their interests? Uh, so for the Russians, uh, they, you know, it, it, they want to talk about what they wanted to talk about for a long time now. It's, it's um, the advantage that the U.S. and NATO have in conventional forces in the European theater, and it's missile defense. And, uh, you know, we talked about SDI a little bit, and, um, you know, that obviously uh, sort of went away as a, as a non-workable issue, but we're still investing heavily in missile defense. And, and unfortunately, we're sinking 
billions of dollars into a system that, that really hasn't been proven to work at, at about a 50% effectiveness rate. So it really boggles my mind that we've been so resistant uh, to talk with the Russians about this, about uh, you know, things that we could do that don't undermine um, our, you know, the goals that we have by having missile defense systems, but also improve strategic stability. Uh, so yeah, those are the things they want to talk about. We want to talk about tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, we want to talk about their, their posture, uh, this concept that they have a posture called escalate to de-escalate in which they would, uh, use a low yield nuclear weapon, uh, in order to end a conventional conflict with your, uh, with NATO. And the thing I always pull at the Russians about, I was like, why are we in a war with you guys? Like NATO and Russia have been trying so long to not get in a war with each other. Tell me exactly what gets us into this war. And they never really have an answer for that. So that's, I, I feel like it's my role to keep picking at them. Uh, but then also to put myself in their shoes because uh, a NATO invasion of Russia is something they actually think about. And to me, that's crazy. I've never once thought, you know, maybe we should invade Russia. Maybe we should do it in the winter time because that always goes so well for everyone. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of where we are. And, and that's why these dialogues are so important to actually be able to hear, uh, you know, my Russian counterparts hearing, you know, how much it hurt uh, on, on our side, uh, the, the interference in our election, you know, me being able to tell to them that Americans view their democracy, um, you know, as part of their core being, this is, this is who we are as our democracy. So when, you know, and, and Russians will say, well, you know, politicians cheat, and elections are corrupt. And I was like, that's not how Americans view it. And so you guys really hit a third rail here. And, and it's those kinds of conversations that I think will help us get uh, to that next step. But first and foremost, as, as has been mentioned by Jessica and others, is that we desperately need to extend the New START Treaty. And uh, the president could do it today if he wanted to. Just just sign a, a diplomatic note and send it over and, and agree with Putin. Um, but uh, if he does, doesn't and Biden's elected, Biden will have 16 and a half days with which to uh, extend the treaty. So uh, it's, it's, it's not totally dead yet, but it's, it's definitely in danger. And if we lose that, we lose the last guardrail um, and 50 years of work against a potential new arms race with the Russians. So, so that's really what's on the line right now. Uh, Alex, can he actually do that? In, or Tom, Tom uh, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Can he actually do that in 16 days? Is that, is that possible? So yes, it's, it's simply an exchange of diplomatic notes. The Russians have said, no, we need the Duma to do all this processing. We don't have to do anything on our side. The Senate already agreed that you know, the president could extend through an exchange of diplomatic yeah, notes yeah. About two years ago. The Russians say we need more time, but I, I point out to them that they, uh, they check mark the annexation of Crimea in a day. So clearly they can move quickly when they want to. <laughs> And uh, Ryabkov has actually uh, said in the last couple of days that they, they could technically move that fast. Tom, um, you wanted to get in here and then I want to send it back to Richard. Could I have 30 seconds? Yeah, 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 go ahead. I just wanted to uh, put in the mix at the end here a slightly uh, uh, light comment, uh, not, not precisely on point what we're talking about now. It's about... Uh, how Gorbachev knew the Cold War was over. It, uh, I believe, appears in his memoirs. And he's, he said he was, it was when he was in Washington signing the INF Treaty, uh, he went with President Reagan to uh, Camp David and they both got into the helicopter and their military aides came with them and they brought the nuclear suitcases and put them side by side. And he said, I looked down at those two suitcases and I knew it was over. <laughs> That's a great story and a perfect one to send it back to you, uh, Richard. And, and then, Kurt, I'll send it uh, back to you uh, af after Richard. With it. I have a few things just to share with the audience. But Richard, um, uh, help finish us off. What, what, so so uh, hopefully we'll be able to be in person in, in the spring. Hopefully at some point we'll be in theaters again. And as we're walking out of the theater, having just watched um, uh, this play, what do you hope is the conversation that theater goers have walking out of seeing your play? You know, I really, really hope when all of the machinery of this subject uh, is explored, that people come back to the concept that this is ultimately something that has to be agreed between two peoples 
who, after all, as Reagan liked to say, have so much in common. He said to Gorbachev at Reykjavik, I know you would never start a war. And Gorbachev said, how do you know that? And he said, because you love your children. And although Gorbachev laughed because that sounded so naive, uh, fundamentally, it's where we all are. And I think if the play can help come back to that idea and help people walk away thinking about that, uh, they won't, as Paul Newman kidded me, uh, leave early to unlock their cars in the parking lot, but will indeed think about common security as the fundamental issue between all of us. That's a Great, wonderful thank you. Thank you. And, and I know that um, a, a lot of times when, when we have these conversations, people say, well, what can I do? What can I do? So let me just suggest a few things and then Kurt back to you on that. Um, obviously come see the play and bring your neighbor so you can talk about these issues and think about what's needed. Um, Jessica's doing really important work at her organization, Global Zero. Um, Alex is doing really important work at her organization, Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist is regularly publishing on these and other issues. Tom's got his new book out and novel, which helps us kind of frame these issues and is chair of Lightbridge, a company that's working to try to make nuclear energy safer, uh, create that fuel. So there are organizations out there that are producing um, thinking and generating conversations and offering the best thinking on issues that often feel intractable with no progress. So I urge you, uh, for those who are joining, should you find this interesting, want to know what you can do more, vote in November, obviously. Um, and then also there's all, we've given you a whole bunch of avenues to follow this up on with. So uh, Kurt, um, back to you. Thank you for providing this platform for us, but let me turn it back to you to help finish us off. Great. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, it, absolutely. We, uh, for those of you who may have joined us late uh, because of all the technical snafus, Tonic uh, hopes to be producing the play in Washington, D.C., uh, and also live streaming it, uh, at least one performance of that production in March into April of 2021. Uh, you can check out Tonic Theater, theater spelled E-R, not R-E, tonictheater.org. Uh, we'll certainly be posting updates there. You can also sign up for emails so that we, uh, we can send you updates. Uh, and I hope there will be more of these events online, uh, which will include uh, updates. We may even try to get our Reagan and Gorbachev in to do another brief reading uh, of a section of the play, as we did in the first live event like this a couple of years ago. Uh, but until then, you can you can track things uh, on tonictheater.org. And uh, I want to thank Richard, uh, not only for being here today, but for writing a play that is really, uh, really a gem and, uh, and uh, beautiful and working with us so hard to, uh, to make it happen. Peter Graham, thank you, Alexandra Bell and Jessica Slate. Uh, and Rachel, uh, if, just one last thing about the bulletin. I believe you're relaunching the magazine uh, or you have relaunched the magazine. Is that true? Yes, just last week we've relaunched it That's for the right. 75th That's anniversary, which is coming up. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone uh, on the bulletin, you can uh, not only get their emails, but you can subscribe uh, to the revamped magazine, which is fantastic uh, and has been around for uh, uh, as long as the bomb has been along. Uh, has been around uh, because they realized they, they needed information about it to go out to the public as soon as they'd released it. Uh, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, more to come. Thank you for your time today. Uh, and again, thanks to all of our panelists. Be well. Thank you.